Welcome, family. Well, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. And during this wonderful hour, we're going to take a look at the past year to reflect on our guest and show topics. I want you to pull up alongside of us, get a cup of coffee, get some hot chocolate, turn on that fireplace. It's a jam-packed lineup. And we can't possibly recap every show from the past year because we only have one hour. But we're going to share some of our fondest memories. Mm. And speaking about fond memories, I think we've had a few in this past year. Uh, just with our own family and our friends and just thinking back to the beginning of the year in January I mean it's such a time for us and for so many people of faith to kick off pro-life work and to have the privilege of going to California San Francisco for the walk for life Canada for the March for life and seeing the people of God assemble by the tens of thousands on behalf of life because that's the true story and uh, it's just such an encouragement and such a privilege that EWTN gives to us and even in our own hometown, the March for Life in January. Well, and then we just had the normal things of life that a married couple goes through. Birthdays, anniversaries, First Communions, right. all the things that you participate in too. But then you had uh, a heart attack in February. Right. Thank <laughs> God we came through that. That wasn't on the calendar. Yeah. And then we also celebrated your 60th birthday. Yep, and right. that was fun. That was a great family time. Right after the heart attack. Mm -hmm. And boy, it was so wonderful just to look into the face of our family and of our friends. Because when you get to the bottom line of it, that's what really marries the Lord and those you're closest to. Yeah, so we had some great memories just like you did. And you, it's so important that you take time to go over your calendar at the end of the year and just look at what you went through. What yeah. did you go through? Things that you could be thankful for. Um, just to say that was wonderful and things that you can also be thankful for that God brought you through that maybe yeah. you didn't put on your calendar. And just reflecting, you know, thinking about the friends and family that we've lost. Mm -hmm and just their faces just coming up to me again in preparation for our time together and giving thanks for their lives, missing their faces. Hopefully we're going to see their faces again and then happy times. I mean, we had numerous birthdays and baptisms and we had two, of course, infant baptisms of our Catholic grandchildren. Then we have one who's a Baptist and so he was baptized. He was like, how old is he? Eight he years was old? six or Six seven, years yeah. old. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, after his baptism, he was fully mm -hmm. immersed and yeah. made a profession of faith and the whole deal. He came out and he never stops moving. And this is Raleigh James and he sat on my lap after mm -hmm. his baptism and he was still wet yeah and he never calms down but he was so calm that he was sitting on my lap and he's just dripping baptism mm -hmm. water you know it was beautiful and I'm just so glad to be alive and to hold him and to know that he like all of our grandkids that have been baptized they're born again by water in the spirit well and then we celebrated a great thing which was a wonderful family wedding in October yeah, yeah. and that was wonderful because we <coughs> went home and we live away from our family and we got to see them face to face yeah. I got to visit with seven of my brothers and sisters you got to see your one sister and your one brother yeah. and all of the nephews and nieces yeah. and that is so important that you take time out in the fullness of our lives um, to go home yeah. and, and to be with family. Yeah. Well, it's certainly been a busy year for us. We're sure with you. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to jump right into a look back into 2015. Don't go away. You're at home with Jim and Joy. We'll be right back. <laughs> Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and today uh, we're going to take a look back at some of our favorite memories from the past year of At Home with Jim and Joy. So I want you to get your cup of coffee, get some hot chocolate. We're going to go to some fabulous show clips and some of our favorite shows, but we won't be able to recap no every guest because we've had a lot of people on, but we're just going to do this in one hour. So be sure, if you want to see the other episodes, go online, go to the show page on EWTN.com or you can always check it out on EWTN's YouTube channel. Well, let's dive right in. Our first memories are from guests who are fighting to defend the dignity 
of the human person. We have Jeannie Mancini, president of the March for Life Education and Defense Fund. Dr. Vincent Fortinace, a Catholic psychiatrist and champion for Alzheimer's patients. And Susan Barrett and Andrea DePaul, who help women get the resources they need to choose life. Let's take a look. You know, one of the things that is most frustrating to me is when abortion proponents advocate it as a good right. for women. And you hear, Anne, um, you hear so many women, um, we have testimonies at the March for Life. We always have a spot for someone who's made that decision and who wishes that they hadn't. Right. At the Supreme Court following the march, we always have silent no more giving testimonies, mom and dads giving testimonies at the Supreme Court, regretting their abortion, and living hopeful and happy lives, not living you know, in darkness, right. but, but acknowledging the hurt that, that comes from that and the consequences that come from that. Um, but I think it's, it's, again, it's so important that we help people to understand that abortion is not good for women. Mm -hmm. I mean, abortion obviously takes the life of a baby, but it, it wounds mom and it wounds dad. Sometimes those wounds are held deep inside for many, 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 many years, and they don't even know it. But I, I can tell you, and I'm sure well, I, I, you can attest to it as well, the tears, the, the pain when someone comes mm -hmm. and shares this sacred information with you, you just would do anything to take that away from them. Mm -hmm. Jeannie, you have a perspective that few people have, not only with the number of people, but the various streams in the pro-life movement, with some emphasize prayer some more, some nonviolent direct action, 40 days for life, being out right at the very site, praying, marches, changing of laws. Are you uh, young people <coughs> coming up and uh, y you see so many things, um, are you encouraged? Do you really believe that there is momentum? Do you think the tide is turning? Wh what do you, what's your sense? Because you, you see it in a way that we don't. Well, I am very encouraged. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I, I will be honest that I, I think that we're steeped often in not the culture of life, in the culture of death and so many different things going on around us. But the flip side is, I mean, you look at the young people that come to the March right. for Life, that go to daily mass, that um, are very excited about good things, and it's so encouraging. Uh, we can we can measure this objectively as well, though. The number of state laws that have passed right. in the mm -hmm. course of right. the last few years, mm -hmm. we're like well over 200, mm -hmm. and these are good common sense laws. These are things like parental notification. Right. Um, informed consent laws. Um, Waiting so period. Exactly, mm -hmm. things like mm -hmm. that. We are um, more and more getting ultrasounds into um, the hands of women mm -hmm. who are expecting and who are debating. And you look at an ultrasound, you see your baby's heart beating, and it's hard not to choose life. Right. You know, it's again, bring it into the life. I think our advances in science and technology, um, they're totally on the side of life. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. the more that we learn about fetal pain, you know, in utero and all of these different things we are winning we are winning I, I I don't have a doubt about that so may take a little bit longer but we will get there they can be examples to other people and for the first time in their life they begin to realize the purpose of life it's not their car not, not, not their house not their looks but their family their faith and all of a sudden they begin to feel that there's a purpose in life and that's what happened to me my fervor really came because I realized that there was just more than material things in life. Right. That what I could give, hopefully, is uh, what I call the real meaning of, of life. You know, uh, not only our purpose for God, and you know, and God means you know, uh, bringing love. Remember, I told you the difference between love and fear. Yeah, and sure. I always see Christ as love. He leads us, and He sees the bright side of everything. Yeah. That even death is just the next step for eternal life. What would you tell people, your, especially your patients, when you talk to them about the meaning of life? You know, how do you encourage them, people in those situations, people that have, you know, have a, a, a drastic thing told to them that they might have a couple years to live or even months to live? How do you, how do you help to counsel them? Well, you know, one of the first ways I do is to say that you know, we are never certain. Yeah. and medicine is never certain. I often give them my example, where I was told that uh, by two physicians that they had never seen anybody survive this illness. Um, and that usually gives them hope. The second thing is that I tell them, I will never abandon you. And I bring in the family and I tell them how important it is right now to be with them, to let them know how useful their life was, right. uh, and still is. 
and you know it's amazing you know pain there's a difference between pain and suffering you know pain is a noxious agent that causes you know uh, aching or stabbing etc suffering is something that's psych psychological existential and it's sort of a loss feeling of abandonment and that by the way if you ever ask anybody very very few people most people think they're going to die and it's always going to be horrific etc well the facts are that only 25 percent of the people all right really die of an illness that'll cause them any difficulty many of them die sudden deaths sure. or, or um, deaths that really do not involve something that really they know it's happening and of those 25 the number that are in pain severe pain are maybe one or two percent mm. and the american academy of neurology and american medical association really stated it has a statement saying that all pain can be treated all pain not that there's one or two that can't be all and the other thing is is that uh suffering that, that i had mentioned about you yes that i mentioned yeah. to you often is something that's very easily taken care of if you feel that other people care yeah. and are going to be Absolutely. with you. And I remember uh, debating Kaborkian, and he said he had this AIDS patient who he states terrified that he was going to die of AIDS. And um, he said he went to him, he put his hand on his, and he said, he says, I will take care of you. And so, and he says, and at that moment his anxiety left and he was at peace. And so I said, well, let me understand this right. I said, so you, he was fearful of dying, right? You told him that you were going to kill him. Yeah. yeah. And he felt better. Right. He walked in and looked at me and uh, I said, uh, I said, or was it that you put your hand on his? You told him that you cared. I said, and that is what he was mm -hmm. looking for. Why don't you share uh, how you got involved with this beautiful apostolate? Yes. Uh, so after I graduated, um, I was asking God where he wanted to be, me to be, and my faith was new, so I wanted to be in a Catholic environment. Um, so I volunteered with Aid for Women as a Vitae Corps member, so living in the home, helping the moms get to prenatal care appointments, helping prepare dinner, watching kids when moms need a break, because single parenthood is tough. So pray for our families. Um, and that, so that was my first year in the organization. And then it, it was probably last spring, so I'm now in my second year as a staff member. Um, it was through Catholic jobs, um, so seeking Christ has, mm -hmm. is what really leads everyone to Aid for Women. Um, and, and for the women, too, they're seeking Christ in the form of hope. Right. And so they come to our home um, just so open and ready to receive what he has. But, and that's, of course, there's conflict and there's difficulty there. You had mentioned before the show um, sorrow and joy and how those things are so intertwined at Heather's house. Every time I look at Caroline and Gio or any of the kids in the home and we think about what blessings they are to all of us, even if it's at dinner time, everyone's had a long day and all of a sudden the kids are doing something crazy at the table and then we're all laughing and we're right. brought together in them and we're present to think that we wouldn't have had that possibly. Right. Mm -hmm. And th you know, that's the beauty of any family, of any household. I mean, we had four kids and we had supper time and we had joy and we had <laughs> sorrow and things happen in yeah. life, you know? And so it's the, it's the way, but it's the way that we become human and we learn to work out how to live and how to love and how to be selfless and how to be prayerful and how to serve. Right, I mean, cause, yeah, because if you, if they come to you and they didn't learn that, then when they come to, you know, your ministry, th those are ways they're going to be discipled and to say maybe it wasn't, men didn't always have to use you. Mm -hmm. And so come and find a new way, find love, find chivalry, find, find a way where you will be loved, honored, adored, and cherished just because of who you are. And that's it's the topic of men in the home. Um, it's it's a difficult one because, and I, he had mentioned it in the interview, but talking about honoring each other, we want the women to honor men and to know that they are called to holiness, this right. example that we have of dignity yeah. and caretaking. So the VCs and all the staff in the home are always praying for the fathers because 
we see how much they're missing out on. Uh, there was um, a verse in the breviary this week from Malachi, and it said, Fathers return to your children, mm-hmm. children return to your fathers. That's the work of Aid for Women, and right. everyone in the pro-life, we're saying we are overlooking great blessings in the forms of our children. Um, they're just calling us to be more like Christ, and so... The moms see that. You should see the transformation from the time that they go to the hospital Mm -hmm. to what they come home in. We're driving the car really slow, Mm -hmm. (laughs) post-surgery, whatever. (laughs) Driving slow, but they are glowing. And you've never seen them with such peace Mm -hmm. before. Did they Mm -hmm. know that something they were so afraid of would bring them so much peace? I certainly enjoyed seeing all those guests. That was so beautiful. And hearing and learning about the great people that we hunt on, but everyone was defending the gospel of life, either from the moment of conception, as Jeannie Mancini was doing, um, Aid for Women, as Andrea was doing with supporting pregnancy and just helping and aiding them, and and Dr. Fortinace, what they were doing with the end of life, right? I mean, we all have to do something. Yeah. There's so many powerful moments, and uh, Dr. Fortinace uh, speaking about his debate, debating Dr. Death, Jack Kevorkian, mm-hmm. and Dr. Kevorkian, if you want to call him a doctor, was, was saying, um, you know, what he offered to the person who was terminal, mm-hmm. and, and Fortinace saying, was it that you offered to kill him, or mm-hmm. was it that you touched his hand and told him you cared? Mm-hmm. It's just so moving. I mean, that's what a doctor is supposed to do, but not just a doctor. Right. All of us, especially to those who are terminal, who are elderly, that we would touch the hand of the other and say, I care. Mm-hmm. You matter. Mm-hmm. And the beauty, everyone's at a different stage and phase in their life, right? But they're all trying to make a difference. You know, Jeannie Mancini, you know, being out there as the leader of March for Life and and gathering a a whole mass of humanity to come to Washington, D.C., to tell our nation and to let the light of Jesus shine. And um, Dr. Fortinace, in the medical field that he's in, uh, defending the culture of life, all of us doing our part to make a difference. Amen to that. Well, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, more memories from 2015. Don't touch the dial. You're at home with Jim and Joy. We'll be right back. Welcome back, family. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy. And Jim, we're big fans of marriage. Absolutely. After being married just a mere 38 years. And if I'm married to you 38 more years, it still would never be enough. I love it. We'd like to share with you some memories from our guests who spend countless hours working to strengthen marriage, starting with Ryan and Mary Rose Barrett, from Witness to Love, Devin Shatt, author of Joseph's Way, The Call to Fatherly Greatness, and Father Paul McDonald from the Oblates of St. Joseph, who shares with us a beautiful devotion to the holy spouses. Let's take a look. Father Michael basically explains that uh, he was so busy, you know, priests are very busy, and, uh, you know, the marriage preparation process, there's so many pieces and, and things to check off, and and you're so busy, and so you just you just need to get the basics done. Mm-hmm. You need to get through it. I mean, I've been doing marriage preparation for 10 years, and I mean, it, it's easy to start just checking off the boxes. Mm-hmm. Um, engaged couples are checking off the boxes, and we start checking off the boxes, mm-hmm. and it just becomes you know a process. Done. Right. Yeah, you done. did it. Yes, done. we did yeah. the But did you encounter right. the relationship of Jesus and each other? But right. you're done. Mm-hmm. So, and he basically says that he had to get to the point where. He saw the engaged couple as someone mm-hmm. and not something mm-hmm. to That's finish. Right. That he had to develop a relationship with the couple. Mm-hmm. And that it was really only through this process, the witness to love process, where he learned to slow down and encounter the couple. Mm-hmm. Because it was so much easier to connect with them in the mentor couple's home. Because his he would come to the mentor couple's home and share with them and hear from them. And that a conversation would happen and that he was entering into a relationship, into a friendship, Mm -hmm. as opposed to sitting behind a desk or sitting in an office. Mm -hmm. So taking marriage preparation out of a a classroom 
and out of an office and into a home. And mm -hmm. so it's a lot, it's so easy when you're sitting in an office to rush. Yeah. So. Well, it just sounds like um, renewal is a key word yes. in, in your title, and it really does sound like the engaged couple is being strengthened by yes. the power of the Spirit. The mentoring couples are having their own marriages renewed, right? Mm -hmm. Because you know, they're coming in, and it sounds like the priests and the deacons, those who are giving the teaching, are also being renewed and are saying it's all about intimacy and relationship and encounter and witnessing in here. So it's really something beautiful and unique that you're bringing in your preparation. Well, we call it witness to love. You know, so it's who, what's, what is witness to love? Right. The engaged couple is witnessing the love of the mentor couple. Mm -hmm. The mentor couple is witnessing the enthusiasm and the joy and the youth of the engaged couple. Mm -hmm. The priest is witnessing the marriage, witnessing the love, but is also receiving. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really, um, the first two priests who had, we'd given a copy of our book to and read it, they said, we stayed up all night. Right. This is, you know, mm -hmm. we had no idea what we were missing. Right. You know, you just, you get, they don't teach this in seminary, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And you know, it, we've heard, you know, God is a family, right? And yes. there's that, that love between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the community, their life and love. But it sounds like what you bring into marriage preparation is a real encounter with that. Uh, sure. you know, and th it's a witness to love between these different people and groups, and they're really entering into that. And in so doing, they're really understanding what marriage is and what marriage does through being a part of this community. It's and beautiful. now we're experiencing, I think, even with this community, a more, more vibrant parish. Yes. You know, after Mass, it seemed oh, like yeah. a lot of people would just run to their car so that the, the lot can clear for the next group. Mm -hmm. So now the group is kind of waiting a little bit, but while a lot of our mentor couples seem to just sort of be hanging out with mm -hmm. couples they mentor. Mm -hmm. Fathers out there, of course, people who are having right. donuts and coffee. Yeah. Just nice things, building up community, mm -hmm. kids running around, which is just a nice thing to see, you it's know, on important. Sunday mornings after mass. Because I always think guys running to St. Joseph. We need to go to St. Joseph, but mm. women need to go to St. Joseph. I mean, you just heard that testimony, and, you know, we're talking about having the best home we can have and the best family, and maybe there are women that feel like, you know, my, my husband, I wish he could be this or that or more. A lot of times I think it's it's asking for the assistance or the aid of somebody like St. Joseph mm. to say, would you pray for my husband or my son rather than, you know, rather than the woman confronting a lot the man. Yeah, well, let's face it. I mean, St. Joseph was given the task to be the head of the Holy Family. And, and then Pius IX, I believe, in uh, 1870 made him the patron of this church, you know, and that word patron comes from the root word in Latin, pater, father. And so Joseph is our father, not the Heavenly Father. He's an icon. But as just as he obtained everything for the Holy Family on earth, he can obtain everything for our domestic families, our domestic churches. And so it's essential that we cultivate a deep abiding relationship with St. Joseph. Because as I think St. Thomas Aquinas said, he said, some saints can grant or obtain graces in particular areas, while others, you know, other areas, but St. Joseph in all things can obtain all graces. Mm -hmm. And so this is very important. So we really need to go to Joseph as the scriptures tell us, and why? Because it's a spirituality. God is Trinity. God wants to reveal his identity in humanity. How does he do this? By creating the man and wife with a need for one another to come together in procreation and love. And then there's a third, right? That's, that's the Trinity, icon of Trinity on earth in the family. Mm -hmm. Well, Mary and Joseph, by their union of wills, their perfect yes to one another, and they're perfect guests of God. In a sense, they drew down, mm -hmm. receptive to the incarnation, the Word made flesh. Well, that's what we need to pray. Joseph, Mary, by the power of the Holy Spirit, let Jesus be conceived in my life. Mm -hmm. Let him be conceived in my mm -hmm. family. So it's not just, I love, Mary is everything to me. Mm -hmm. But it's not just Mary, mm -hmm. and it's not just Joseph, mm -hmm. just like it's not just you or you. Right, it's right, the two of you right. together that gives birth to your family, gives birth to the church, right? It's the same thing with them. We need to go to both of them and ask them to obtain for this a gift of Jesus being born in us. And that's the whole spirituality of the Fathers of St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. you know? tell, yeah, tell us about the Fathers of St. Joseph and how you are transmitting this wisdom, this spirituality that the Lord has revealed to you and Joseph has revealed to you? How are you transmitting that to others? Well, the, the Joseph's Way was a book that I wrote to myself. It was a letter to myself, and I, um, as I was sharing this with a friend, he said, hey, we can't keep this between us any longer. We need to share it with a broader audience. So we developed the Confraternity of Fathers, the Fathers of St. Joseph. 
and basically I thought maybe seven guys would show up or something like that, but mm -hmm. every first and third Wednesdays we've got a huge group of guys, fill the hall and everything, but the spirituality is basically this. Man has a theological position in the drama of salvation, and he's called to be the defender, the kustos, mm -hmm. the guardian of the family, and setting that pace of self-giving love. How he goes is how the family goes, mm -hmm. as the stats show us. Um, so he has to live out four pillars to uphold his location and his vocation. His location is guardian and protector and provider, and his vocation is lived up by carrying out these four pillars, embracing silence, embracing woman, embracing the child, and embracing charitable authority. And so that's our spirituality. So every time we meet, we're talking about some aspect of these four pillars and what it means to be a real man, an authentic father, and how to help in the restoration, redemption, and re revitalization of the world. Can you say those four again? Yeah, so sure. Can. Embracing silence. So there's okay. three aspects, silence and self, Silence before men, not to be noticed by men, you know, known to God, and then silence before God, doing things in secrecy, wow. you know, with God. Yeah. Then there's embracing women, that is, embracing all women, their feminine genius and dignity, where we need Christ's redemptive grace to heal us from objectifying them. Embracing and remaining yoked to our wives, which can be difficult at times, and then embracing the woman, Mary. And then embracing the child, which is becoming the voice, the face, the touch of the Father that our children cannot hear feel, see. And then lastly, charitable authority, to be the provider, the protector, and the teacher, you know, yeah. uh, for the family. Right. When you're praying to the holy spouses or asking their intercession, that it's not simply for you, it's for your family. Right. And that's really and powerful. That, and that's part of the prayer. That's the mm -hmm. second part mm -hmm. of the prayer that we offer, which is mm -hmm. holy spouses, pray for us sinners, our families and communities, mm -hmm. now and at the hour of our death. Can you say the whole so, prayer, Father? Uh, I got it if you can. Yes, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> yes. a beautiful prayer, and again, uh, com composed through the inspiration of Father yeah. Larry Toski. So it's Mary, full of grace, and Joseph, son of David. And I'd like to break it apart a little bit, yes. because Mary, full of grace, is the salutation of the angel to Mary at her annunciation. Mm -hmm. Joseph, son of David, is the salutation of the angel to Joseph mm -hmm. in the dream. Mm -hmm. So Mary, full of grace, and Joseph, son of David, honor to you, Mother of God, mm -hmm. which is the first kind of official title given to our Blessed mm -hmm. Mother at the Council of Ephesus, the Theotokos, right. uh, Mother of God, and to you, Guardian of the Redeemer. Mm -hmm. And the guardian of the Redeemer comes to us from St. John Paul II mm -hmm. uh, in his beautiful apostolic exhortation uh, written in 1989, Redemptoris Custos, mm -hmm. uh, guardian of the Redeemer. So we kind of place those two titles in reference mm -hmm. to Mary and Joseph. Right. And then eternal praise to the child with whom you formed a family, mm -hmm. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Holy spouses, pray for us sinners, our families and communities mm -hmm. now and at the hour of our death. Amen. You got it exactly so, right. <laughs> so there you go. Well, big Father Larry proud. <laughs> no, but there's but, so much to yes, unpack here, yeah. as you've said. And we've yes. enjoyed, like we've never exactly. prayed this prayer. Exactly. Until we knew you were And coming. with each of the mysteries uh, to, to the holy name of Jesus, there is also a kind of a title, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's uh, a Messiah, Son of Man, mm -hmm. uh, Emmanuel, you know, that's also yeah. kind of... Um, you know, places a specific title mm -hmm. to the name of Jesus. And it's so, so beautiful. You know, one time I'll share a personal story. J uh, Jim was traveling. He had another job at this time, and and I had come through cancer, and it's probably medicine related too. But I was probably having post traumatic stress and everything. It was just mm -hmm. a. It was like a bad day. Yeah. And so we had said our prayers at the end of the night, and I got off the phone with him, and I remember leaning over the counter in the kitchen, and I was all ho home alone, and. And I, um, I just cried out because I had to get from my kitchen to my bedroom. And I didn't know how to do that. And so I called on, this is what I said. I said, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, come and get me to my bed. Mm -hmm. I mean, heaven, help me, come, aid me, assist me. I just mm -hmm. called them down. I, I called on the best because yeah, <laughs> it, like, right. it was it was the worst. Yes, it was it was yeah. a worse. It was a terrible time, mm -hmm. and um, and I, all I can remember is being walked to my bedroom, getting in my bed, curling up in a fetal position, and just going to sleep. Mm -hmm. But I'll never forget the encounter of their presence because mm -hmm. there was no way that my human person and all my brokenness mm -hmm. was going to make that journey. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was just like, I I need help. Mm -hmm. I got to get there. You know. Right. And, uh, and and they came and aided me and right. assisted me. Right.
and how beautiful it is to see the dimension of the family yes. in the Holy Family. And of right. course, we celebrate the Feast of the Holy Family, uh, usually the Sunday in between Christmas mm -hmm. and, uh, and New Year's. The traditional date is December 30th, but it's normally celebrated the Sunday between mm -hmm. Christmas and New Year's during the Christmas octave. And the Feast for the Holy Feast Spouses. Feast of the Holy Spouses is January 23rd. Incredibly and powerful January day. 23rd. Tell so us why that's in incredible, the 23rd. Yes. Roe v. Wade, the 22nd. Right? Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the kind yeah. of coincidence mm -hmm. in with that as well. So, you know, um, so that's something that we try to promote. In fact, I remember one time meeting a uh, young lady. She was planning on getting married, and uh, I didn't think much, you know, knowledge was known of the Feast of the Holy Spouses. And I said, oh, she's, I said, when are you getting married? And uh, she said, uh, I'm getting married January 23rd. She goes, it's the Feast of the Holy Spouses. Wow. Mm. Well, I almost fell over. Yeah. I yeah, said, like, how did knows? you know that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was so mm. proud of that fact that she knew mm -hmm. that, that particular feast. And we celebrated as Oblates of St. Joseph in our parishes, uh, both in the Diocese of Scranton in Pennsylvania, as well as mm -hmm. our parishes in California, mm -hmm. Sacramento and uh, uh, Fresno, and also in the Diocese of Monterey. Well, Joy, what struck me in those uh, sharings is just the clarity mm -hmm. and the passion mm -hmm. of uh, the Verrett's, Devin Shatt, Father McDonald. And uh, in, in this world, it's, it's so absurd. Yeah. Um, and that word absurd, its root is surdus in Latin, which means we can't hear, we're deaf. Mm -hmm. But these people, the people at EWTN, <laughs> gives us the privilege of hearing. They're clear, yeah. they're sounding a clear trumpet. They're saying, this is what marriage is. This is what pre-engagement preparation should be like. This is what it means to be a man in the society. And just saying that so clearly, so loudly, so that we could run to that roar and be all that we could be at this time. Well, and what I loved was in all of the interviews, it was that fire yeah. that was lit in them yeah. and, and the passion that they had. They believed with every cell in their body yeah. that marriage was designed by yeah. God and yeah. marriage is good and marriage is God's plan to transform the world. Yeah. I mean, they believed it. And it and for every time that we had a guest come on, and, and we still do, it's so wonderful, it infuses you. Yeah. It's like, oh my goodness, we, there's so many beautiful apostolates out there that come along you, aside you and to aid you and assist yeah. you and say, come on, we're going to help you run this race. You're not alone because sometimes don't we all feel alone? We feel my marriage is the worst marriage in the world. This isn't going to work. I can't. I need help. I need assistance or even in your faith journey. But there are apostolates out there working hard and doing a great ministry and a service. And EWTN brings that, right? So they could say, come on, you could do this. Absolutely. And I don't think a day has gone by since having Father Paul McDonald on that we don't ask the intercession of the Holy Spouses. Right. And that's been beautiful because we've asked Mary's prayers, Joseph's prayers now, Mary, Mother of God, Joseph, Guardian of the Redeemer. Mm -hmm. Oh, to have that couple right. praying is just a beautiful, beautiful thing. Well, time's flying on the shelf. There are so many great memories and so much to share. Remember, you can watch all our full episodes online by going to showpageewtn.com, show page, or by checking out EWTN's YouTube channel. We still have one more set of memories to share with you, but first, we have to go to a break. Who else are we going to see today? Find out when we come back. Stay tuned. Don't go away. with Jim and Joy and of course we wanted to dedicate this last segment to the most important element of our society the family we know that there are so many attacks on the family so what can we do to strengthen our family and direct them all mm. toward heaven Amen. in 2015 we had so many guests on the show that work so fervently to uplift the family we obviously can't recap all of them today, but we're going to share a few of them with you. First, EWTN's beloved psychologist, Dr. Ray Garendi, then Chuck and Joanne Wilson sharing about devotion to the Sacred Heart, and Timothy Schmalls, a sculptor, 
whose work shares a special message about mercy. Let's take a look. Punishment, authority, discipline, right. control. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. shrinks have all put negative tinges on those words. Mm -hmm. All of them. Mm -hmm. Punishment is essentially, if you look at behavioral theory, punishment basically says, here's an aversive consequence that is supposed to change the frequency of this behavior. Right. The church is doing a lot in terms of looking at the family, speaking about the family. The Extraordinary Synod last October dealt with pastoral concerns regarding the family in light of the new evangelization, which I think is a mouthful, but interesting. And the upcoming synods dealing with the mission of the family in the church and in the world. From your perspective, what are your concerns regarding the family, pastoral concerns that you have? What what keeps you up a little bit regarding family? In a macrocosmic way, there's always this balance between welcoming, pastoral, understanding, empathy, and truth. In our culture, when you speak truth, automatically it is assumed this drops mm -hmm. flat mm -hmm. out. Okay, so in a microcosmic way, this is the balance. But on a personal level, parents will say, well, you know, my sister's divorced. She comes over here with her new boyfriend. What, what am I supposed to do? I, I, you're supposed to love your sister. Mm -hmm. Where she is, you're supposed to love your sister. I don't want her thinking I approve of that. She knows you don't approve of it. She knows that's part of your belief system, okay? Mm -hmm. But you still, you have to start out loving. You have no chance otherwise. A parent will come to me with a homosexual son or daughter. Same-sex attraction. <sighs> okay. I mean, he wants me to go to his apartment. I mean, I, uh, his partner's not there, but I, I don't want to do it. Well, wait a minute. Uh, you, you, the only chance you're going to have to influence that person where they are, whatever sinfulness you think they're partaking in, is to love them first. You've got to love them. And people confuse this idea of love with condoning. Okay. If I love you... If I don't speak of the fact that you're here with your new girlfriend after you left your wife and two kids, who's my sister, mm -hmm. kind of thing, but mom wants you here because it's family and she wants to see the grandkids and it's your week to visit, okay, you, you've, you've, you've got to love them at least a little bit where they are. You have no chance. Mm -hmm. But it's also a teachable moment where you can tell your children. Where'd you get that phrase? See well, that? You, you've been reading them psychology <laughs> books. But it, but because, you know, believe me, I have seven brothers and sisters and we do all sorts of different things too. And so when we would come from Alabama and go to New Jersey, I mean, my brothers came in with cases of beer and my son turned to me and said, Mama, are we related to these people? And, and you I said, said, one of those cases is mine. I said, yes, those are my brothers. Oh. And they were like, what? Are we um, related to these people? Talk the, about protecting your kids, right? Are we related know, to these people? But they were just, and they make different life choices oh. than we do. And so, you know, you really can speak into it. But the essence was taught that we're, that's my brother. And I'm going to love him or my sister no matter what they do because that's what Jesus would want me to do. We know the cross is real, mm -hmm. and we know that suffering and sickness is also part of our journey, and that dying is part of being born to eternal life. I think the difference is the strength mm -hmm. and the peace mm -hmm. to walk the road that the Lord has in mind for us, and we pray always for healing. We do have stories of uh, a person, actually one of our missionaries, uh, blood count uh, went up dramatically after the enthronement, mm -hmm. was able to start some treatment that couldn't happen. We love those stories, mm -hmm. but it's really deeper than that, and um, it's really deeper than, you know, a physical healing. It, a lot of it is a spiritual healing, mm -hmm. preparing our souls. Mm -hmm. And what we've noticed is mm -hmm. just returning from the world meeting of families, as mm -hmm. you mentioned, Jim. We, we heard the talks. We know the state of the family. It's in crisis today. Mm -hmm. No family is without crisis right. today. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason that we've gotten involved with this ministry, we opened this up to anybody, is we need to get Jesus in the homes. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the key. Mm -hmm. Because as we remove Jesus from the home, we've seen it hasn't worked. Right. And we go into homes where there is no images, no crosses, mm -hmm. no 
pictures, no, it's just blank, it's mm -hmm. vanilla. Mm -hmm. And uh, we find the husbands on one side, the wives on the other, the kids, and when we return a week later, mm -hmm. when they've been praying the rosary, mm -hmm. they're together, mm -hmm. the family said, this has been a wonderful week, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, so they now have a shrine in their home mm -hmm. that is reminding them that Jesus is going to be the Lord of this house mm -hmm. once you enthrone it. So we, yeah. we have, talking about mm -hmm. testimonies, we have one that we did, and Joanne and I didn't know, beautiful family, mm -hmm. we didn't know what was going on, but she had an addiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She brought it to her husband and said, I now need help. Mm -hmm. 90 days later, she has come oh, back. Yeah. It's been a whole year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What has happened to that family alone mm -hmm. was worth it. Transformation. Mm -hmm. We have another family that we didn't know. There was a little mar marital crisis. Mm -hmm. We enthroned. It looked like this was not going to work. Mm -hmm. They are back together stronger than ever. Mm -hmm. We have one that w were having a problem with fertility. They wanted another child. Mm -hmm. And he's written it on our website, enthronements.com. And basically, after the enthronement, mm -hmm. the knock came on the door mm -hmm. and said, we, we hear that you might be interested mm -hmm. in adoption. Mm. Yeah. My girlfriend is pregnant, yes. and she would like to give it to you. Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> I yes. mean, mm. nine mm. months later, on the Feast of the Sacred Heart, on the Feast of the Sacred Heart. They, they bring it on. Yeah. So we mm -hmm. couldn't write these scripts. Right. Yeah. Right. What we noticed is, and for everybody is, when you enthrone and you read the 12 promises, they're so powerful, bring peace to the families uh, and so forth. But what we noticed, it didn't bring peace. Mm -hmm. It created some <laughs> issues for some our family. Yeah. Yeah. The but hidden things were for, being exactly. revealed and the secret things are being made known. Perfect. Yes. Mm -hmm. And by them, now we are a stronger family. Right. Father, you have great devotion to Padre Pio, and I you do. understand now that, that Tim has made a sculpture of Padre Pio. It's a, um, in, in kind of a confessional one. It's an incredible. I, I, when I saw the picture of it, I, I thought to myself, we need to get something like that here, mm. especially in this year of mercy. Mm. Um, we have so many pilgrims coming here. Um, that would be an incredible addition to have here, to have that, you know, Padre Pio's on one side of the confessional, okay. and he's um, raising, he's listening. You can tell that he's listening to someone's confession, and he has his hand up against the confessional, I believe. Um, and on the on the other side, the penitent is actually seeing the face of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, in your in your statue right yeah. here is just incredible. And this, yeah. is, this Padre Pierre is listening right here. He's listening to the person, and a wow. priest is in persona Christi, he's, he's in the person of Christ. And on the other side of this sculpture is Jesus. Mm. And he's raising his hands and you can see his wounds, right. his glorious wounds. Mm. And mm. if you know a little bit about Padre Pio, a couple weeks before he died, the stigmata actually healed, <laughs> you know, in his body. Wow. He had the stigmata for literally 50 years as a priest. And right before he died, the stigmata actually healed. Now, theologically, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because mm -hmm. the only ones with the wounds in heaven are who? Jesus. Jesus yeah. Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ himself mm -hmm. is the only one that has those glorious wounds in heaven. Mm -hmm. He allowed Padre Pio to share in those wounds here on earth a, yeah. as a living really incarnation of him, you know, um, mm -hmm. suffering of him and his passion. And in Tim's uh, sculpture, that shows that perfectly. Yeah. You know, when mm -hmm. I see that, that gives me an image when I'm in the confessional mm. <laughs> to think about, to pray about, because I often, when I'm in the confessional, I often, when I raise my hand in absolution, yeah. I think to myself, first of all, who am I? <laughs> who am I to do this? Mm -hmm. And to think to myself that, it's Jesus Christ that mm. is really the one that is working. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's the one who's doing the healing, right? Yeah. He's the one who's doing uh, the, the healing of the soul. Yeah. How did this come to you? I mean, did you see a picture of this in your own mind's eye, Tim? You know, this, this image of Padre Pio, and then didn't you put it to clay, or how, how did that? Yeah, happen? it was an amazing experience. First of all, it was in Rome, and I just met Pope Francis uh, with the gospel sculpture, uh, Jesus the Homeless, he blessed it, and, and right. um, I'm walking, uh, I, I go back to my hotel room, and 
before I went to Rome, I'm doing as much research uh, of uh, Padre Pio as possible, and I'm getting angry with all these skeptics about, you know, the, you know, this, he got to use, you know, Vaseline or chloroform or something, and I got so angry, and I thought, don't they just understand? He's, mm. he's an imitator mm. of Jesus, mm. that's right. and that's what it's about. It's not a, don't, you know, and, and look at Padre Pio, there's way too much of this, uh, they're, they're missing the point, it's like they're blind to the point that he's an imitator of Christ. And so what I wanted to do with my, at my sculpture is have that hand with that bandage reaching out and then when you walk and sit down, your eureka moment is you're expecting mm. to see uh, Padre Pio mm -hmm. through an open window, mm. but I close the, the, that window to sculpt Jesus mm. with his yeah. hand in the same gesture. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was it, creating that sculpt, sculpture was amazing. Um, it took me, uh, every day I would, uh, I would go to work on it, and I kid you not, I started thinking about some of the most horrible things that I've ever done in my life. Mm. And I was just chewing on this as I'm sculpting on it. Mm. And then I start thinking, after I'm done with me, then I start thinking about humanity, the broader sense of horrors mm. in the world. Mm. And then I realize, this is how my, my mind thought. I thought as I'm sculpting, he wants me to confess right here as I'm sculpting it. And then so my every piece of clay I put on, I realize that I am kind of confessing all my sins and all of humanity's mm. sins as I'm working on it. So it was, it was, I tell you, it was a very spiritual experience. Wow. Yeah. Mm. And uh, yeah, and so I, I hope when the piece is life-size and people actually have the experience to go there and sit there and touch the hand of Jesus, that um, Padre Pio was known for his amazing yeah. confession. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Hours Eight hours, hours a day yes. type thing. And my, so a little a part of my heart thinks, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. In his hometown, he'll, he'll be eternally there mm -hmm. for people to sit and to, if yeah. they want, like I did, uh, ask, for, ask for forgiveness. Hun, I love our show, and I love all the guests that we were able to bring. <laughs> Such a great variety. I mean, Dr. Ray Grundy, there is nobody like Dr. Ray. <laughs> That's for sure. And then the beautiful Wilsons with their wonderful story yeah. and the fabulous sculptor that we had in Tim Schmalls. I mean, you're not going to get that anywhere. I mean, you're only going to get that on EWTN. And what a privilege for us, you know, to interview them, to have them enrich our own personal lives, but then to bring them to you at home so that you then are a part of the family, a part of the solution for life, for marriage, and the family. And no, it's not happening any other place than on at EWTN. Yeah. It, it was amazing to watch the clips of mm -hmm. the whole year and not even notice ourselves, even yeah. at home with Jim and Joe. I mean, I just didn't feel like I even saw us. It's just like, thank God that the gospel of life, marriage, and family is going forth in this world in the midst of all this confusion, mm -hmm. that there's a clear voice and a clear message, and that life, marriage, and family will prevail. You know, Joy, we know that we're sitting at a table that we've not set, mm -hmm. okay? So EWTN is set. I think by the Lord himself, it's set by our founders, Mother Angelica, and it's set by all the people out there, the family, mm -hmm. uh, that make this possible. And uh, we want, you know, we love you, and we're grateful for you, and when we say you're at home, welcome to the family, that's Mother's spirituality. Mm -hmm. That's Catholic, Christian spirituality. And we all yearn for family, and we just want everybody to know you're never alone. Mm -hmm. You're never alone. You're always a part of this family, no matter what's going on in your life, no matter how broken or confused, believers and non-believers as well, anybody who tunes in here, hey, you're a part of the family, and that's at the core of who we are as human beings, as EWTN, and, and the family of God. And you're always going to get the truth. And, and to, to for all the guests that we had, they were ordinary people, God using them to do extraordinary things, sinners on the road to be becoming holy, trying to be saints, striving, working it out to yeah. the best of their ability, but being surrounded by a great yeah. cloud of witnesses yeah. in heaven. Yeah. And that's that's just the beauty of, of what we get to do. And, and we're so thankful for our producers and the, for the fabulous crew, for everyone that works so hard behind the scenes to make it all yeah. happen. Really, from all of us here, at EWTN, and I mean all of us here, to you. 
may you have a great conclusion to 2015. May 2016 be the best year of your life. And that's all the time we have for today. Be sure to check us out, all of our episodes online, going to show page on EW10.com or checking us out on EW10 YouTube channel. And we're still going to be around in 2016, Lord willing. So make sure you tune in every Monday and Thursday. You're an important part of the family and you're invited to participate in the show by email, phone call, Twitter, or by joining us live at home with Jim and Joy. Again, remember you're an important part of the family. You're always at home with Jim and Joy. May you and your family have a blessed new year. We'll see you in 2016. Bye now.